Hey, I'm Decathlon Gamer. Welcome back to Draft Day Sports College Basketball. This is episode 38, and we are still alive in the tournament. Surprising, because this is supposed to be a slightly down year for us, just slightly, but we, we definitely thought it was, you know, somewhere between a retool and a rebuild, and yet not only did we go on to claim the conference and make the tournament, as one of the lower seeds, we then pulled off the first round upset and the second round upset and find ourselves in the Sweet 16 against Georgetown. Georgetown also pulled an upset. We're a 14 seed. They are a 10 seed, giving us a pretty legitimate shot. In fact, this is technically the easiest game we have had out of the three that we'll have played here in this tournament. Georgetown, Conference B, just 18 and 12 this season, 8 and 8 in the conference. Essentially barely qualifying for the tournament with an at-large probably 4th, 5th place, maybe 6th place in the division. So, middle of the road. Now, they're, they're only giving us a chance, I mean 42%, but that's a bigger chance than what we had in the first two games, and yet here we are. So... Uh, it certainly give us a, a pretty legitimate shot. The worrying thing, though, is their record against top 25 teams, in particular top 10 teams. 4-1 and one this season against top 10 opponents, including a win at home against then number one Ohio State, 81-65, to so pretty comfortable against the then number one ranked team in the nation. They have the advantage at point guard, no surprise there, is Mike Harris, and that's been my worrying part for this year. You know, he's three and a half points a game, five assists is all. He runs the offense decently enough to distribute for the other four, but that's about all he does. He doesn't defend well. There's a lot of worrying signs. But fortunately, their point guard actually isn't good either. Woodruff, five and a half points a game, couple, right? You're giving up a couple points there, but the assists rebounds it's all pretty similar other than he gets an extra steal per game so he is definitely a better defender than Mike Harris is but he's not he, he's their weakest player too he's better than Harris but he's their weakest player love though fairly strong advantage we could expect a, a big game from love Johnson no advantage, but when you do the head-to-head -head comparison, Johnson's putting up massive, massive numbers in comparison, especially, you know, seven points a game more, doubling the assists, the rebounds, like all of it looks better in terms of production. Stetson, one of our weaker points, but similar to the guy he's going up against. And then Hold has the advantage, so we have enough advantages that you think maybe we do have a shot and then even though our bench has been outplayed in terms of numbers they think we have the advantage so maybe that will be a bit of a wash you would think and then the team stats of course you know you have to take our points with a grain of salt because we're playing in a much smaller conference so a lot of our opposition has been a bit easier embellishes some of those numbers a little bit so shave off five points add five points defensively and it would look like yeah maybe our defense is slightly better than theirs but otherwise we're very similar field goal numbers three pointers free throws very similar assists a eh, slight advantage but similar rebounds a little over three a game better than them that that's a slightly good sign. I mean, that, that should give us a slender edge there. And when you look at our post matchup, stats an equal hold advantage. So yeah, maybe we would have an advantage there. Blocks, definitely a slender advantage there. And they do have a small advantage on steals. But then there's the turnovers part. Huge advantage. Six a game, better. So we take care of the ball better than they do. Which means... Our defense has a chance to force a lot of turnovers against them, and that could. That could be the, the ticket we need to 
continue on and and stay alive in this tournament. Georgetown has shown themselves to be beatable 12 times this season. And while we have not been perfect this year, we keep going, right? We we keep chugging along and 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 turning out numbers and their highest average is somebody on the bench, by the way. <laughs> their starter, Jeff Hammond, 8 8.9 points per game. Their scoring leader is Andy Walker freshman center 10 and a half points per game off the bench so we got to watch out for that one but it's ed hold who's going to be playing against him most of the game anyway and that should hopefully help stymie those two a little bit so just a reminder that this is the same georgetown team that what maybe two seasons ago won the championship and of course have a wealth of history of being a championship caliber team, uh, particularly in the 90s where they were totally dominant. Some of uh, the NBA greats, some of those Hall of Famers were members of the that 90s Georgetown uh, team. But we're off to a good start here. It's four to two, now six to two, as we've played just three minutes so far, but our defense has made things difficult for them, though they do just double their score there. McLean and Hammond, the first two to score, uh, just one assist for them. They've got a few rebounds already. Well, we only have one, but hold already four points. So hold and love. Those are the guys I'm looking to today. Uh, I think Johnson should put up his normal numbers. Uh, but if love has a decent day, then I think we're going to be in great shape. It's 8-4. Love already with two steals, a rebound, and an assist, though he has not scored. But that is already... Uh, big time production from him in the early stages of this one as we are now up five points with the three-pointer there cuts that lead by more than half it's 13 11 looking good early on though forcing a lot of turnovers early on let's let's see what are the numbers turnovers we have two they have seven already seven turnovers dang okay we are all over in that department but only a slight lead 17-13 after we make that long two. Not a shot I like players to be looking for. But if you're down on the clock, you got to get what you can get. 19-13. Back-to-back buckets for us. And they do answer. Johnson with a three-pointer. 22-15. He's got seven so far. Thomas off the bench has six already. Hold back into the game with four points we keep trying to pull out a bit of a lead we keep starting to stretch it but as soon as we score they answer but then we seem to hold them otherwise one for two from the line though leads to our biggest lead and then we follow it up on the next possession which i think was a, a turnover transition bucket there uh, at least at the pace that it seemed to to go by 29 20 now biggest lead of the game still single digits turnover steal transition bucket 31 20 i'm not sure how many of those we've had so far but we've definitely seen in the last couple of minutes some transition play going in our direction and somehow while stretching the lead, they make one field goal and they have the momentum. <laughs> we force turnovers, we get transition buckets, we're converting our shots, and they have the momentum. It's 36-25, another three-pointer there. That was William Love with that one. And we finally stymied their uh, momentum that they had gained by getting another and another. It's 39, well, was 39-25 there for a moment. Biggest lead of the game at 14. They've cut it to 12. They missed that one in close. 41-27 as we make another bucket. That was Wheel. Off the bench, he's already back to the bench. Johnson already into double digits. Two assists and two rebounds. Uh, Hold has four rebounds so far. He's not scoring a ton, but he's only had five shots. Made three of them. Total rebounds, minus two. Turnovers, plus six. 17 for 29 from the field while they are 9 for 22. So we've had 7 shots more than them. Partially thanks to the turnovers. Partially thanks to the rebounds. But we're also making those shots. 58% from the field while they are 39% from the field. We're up by 12. Free throws. 
helping keep them in the game. 11 for 13 to our 5 or 7. Fouls are similar, though, but they're getting to the line. Three-pointers, 50%, 5 for 10, while they are 2 for 9. A lot of things going in our favor as we build some momentum again, and we reach the half. It's 48-31. <laughs> okay. By the way, this is our second time in the Sweet 16, and right now... We are in cruise control. Fast break was in our favor, and that little stretch where we opened that lead up from, what, 6 to 11 points or something like that, some of that came off of at least two fast break transition buckets, and there, there was only three in the entire half. So that was the important turning point that, that took a slight lead and, and turned it into something quite a bit bigger. Hold did not shoot for quite a while. He, he had those six points early on he did get two free throws late in the half but a great performance great performance all around for the team and look at the bench okay add that all together and we're looking at a tremendous field goal percentage just a couple misses from fall one from wheel one from penders otherwise they made every shot so that that's a good 60 percent from the bench and three out of the four misses were three-pointers. So you know, tougher shots, right? <laughs> Further out. Really, really strong, strong performance from our bench. Fouls, that's one we obviously need to watch out for. Fall has two. Johnson and Stetson each have two. As for them, Walker off the bench, that's the leading scorer for them, but he is over two right now, both three-pointers, and sitting on two fouls. And then Woodruff. Woodruff is the point guard that uh, is matching up with Harris. This is the guy who's supposed to be their big man. Well, their their advantage. Not their big man, their advantage. He's their weakest starter, but he's the one place where they had a, a significant gain over us, and yet Harris has outscored him. Uh, rebounding is within one. We're plus one in assists. And we're plus one on the turnovers, plus two on the fouls. I mean, we're, we are, Woodruff has been outplayed by Harris so far. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you know, Johnson four for eight, but two for three from three. Productive three rebounds. Holds got six already. Great first half. Great first half. Really happy with where we're at right now. And we've already gotten pretty far down our bench. I mean, we've already had six guys in the game. All right. Right now, our worst enemy is momentum. So we got to watch out for that one as we score early on. And that was already off of a foul. So trip to the line for both in the first minute. 20-point lead. 20-point lead. Was that an and-one situation that we had ourselves? Both on two fouls just over a minute into the half. Uh, thinking about decreasing that defensive intensity a little bit at this point to limit the fouls. Just a little. Just a little. But it could lead to momentum for them. But, the, you know, I think the biggest momentum maker for our opponents is fouls. And, and I decrease the momentum and we have two fouls instantaneously. I don't know how I went from two to four fouls in the same moment. Did we literally have? I, I've seen offsetting fouls. <laughs> I've seen that call before. I've seen each team being given a foul at the same time, but I, I don't think I've ever seen. We have five fouls already. Five minutes into the half, and we have five fouls. I, D, I, 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 it's still intense, though. We're still playing intense defense, but we're up by 24 points. We're up by 24 points. Uh, so it's okay. It's okay, seven fouls. I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous about the fouls getting them back into this game. Missing close. Quick transition. We finally get to the free throw line. Their third foul. And they cut the lead back down to 21 now. The lead's comfortable, but, you know, we... NBA Finals, right? We saw huge leads go away in a hurry in that series because of you get up by a lot 
you make a change or two, you back off, you take your foot off the gas ever so slightly, and then the other team just lights it up. And, you know, just huge momentum swings. I remember, uh, oh gosh, what was it, like game three or something like that. Uh, Golden State was up a lot. Mid, late third quarter. Iguodala and just a couple other bench guys. Like, it wasn't all five or anything. There was still a couple starters on, on the court. It, it was very much not your, you know, garbage time players. But Iguodala comes on, makes a lazy pass, gets intercepted. Uh, Peyton Pritchard, I think, was the one who intercepted it. Peyton Pritchard, uh, Oregon Duck, like myself. 21-point uh, lead, by the way, with eight minutes to play here. Pritchard intercepts it. They get a transition bucket. And crowd cheers for the first time in in half an hour. That's an exaggeration, but first time, like, solid. Wow, crowd, happy, into it. Just a little lift. Just a little lift in the players. Possession or two later, Iguodala, same thing. Another lazy pass, intercepted, another transition bucket. That was four points out of, you know, like a 24-point lead. 24 went to 20. That in itself, nothing. But two lazy passes, and all of a sudden, Boston felt good. And then they just played hard. And in like a minute and a half, that lead went down inside 10. There was two timeouts during that stretch. The starters were back on the court after the first timeout, but that momentum carried over. You know who we didn't see the rest of that game or in game four in the same type situation? Andre Iguodala. He was back for like game five, but uh, he was definitely made to sit out. Two minutes to go, up 18. They have cut that gap a little bit, and let's go ahead and use a 30-second timeout while they have a little momentum, and we do cut that momentum out with that timeout, and then we score and give ourselves a little momentum to try to seal this game, and we go back up by 20. It's going to be a win. We are going to get to the Elite Eight. Oh, okay, stat comparison, rebounds, plus one. Turnovers, plus 10. I was telling you that was the key to this one. Still shooting 50% from the field, 35 for 69. 22 of 48 for them. They really picked up that field goal percentage here in the second half. Of course, that gap, you know, here in the last minute, they, they cut into it a little bit as, well, that last field goal stretch back out. 91-74 final. We didn't win by that 20 that we had. They they gained on us. But a lot of that gain just came in that last minute or so uh, in partial garbage time. I mean, Ryan Falls out there playing at the moment. And uh, anyway, we see the game out. They cut the gap a little bit. But their field goal percentage went up a lot in the second half. Their three-point percentage in particular, they were like 2 for 10 in the first half. They end up 7 for 16. So uh, I don't know if the 2 for 10 was accurate, but it was definitely not a good field goal percentage. It might have been 2 for 9. But whatever it may be, they they made five three-pointers in the second half where they only made two in the first and did it on fewer attempts. Uh, the free throws continue to be a thing. We ended up double bonus. Obviously, we had, what, seven fouls in the early minutes. That helped them get back into that game big time. McLean ended up with 18. Woodruff, never score. Four assists for him. Harris, seven points, four assists. <laughs> he won that battle. He won that battle. Three of three shooting. Fantastic job from him. Ryan Fall continues to struggle. That was that was the guy I was hoping was going to be a pretty solid recruit. He did not do much this season. Really hasn't. We limited his minutes a bit here for the postseason and... Uh, he, he just continues to, to not perform terribly well. He's not awful, but he does not shoot well for sure. Johnson, 19 points today. Hold, double-double, 22 and 10. At the exact moment of the end of our game, here's where things stand. Oklahoma has beaten Tennessee, and Nevada has knocked off with the upset over UConn to make the Greensboro region a final in St. Louis. This elite... Elite Eight matchup is also set now. It's Miami having knocked off Iowa State. Arizona being upset by Virginia Tech, though that's not much of an upset for a three to beat a two. So a one-three matchup there. In Atlanta, 
Gonzaga, one seed blowing out West Virginia. They were a 13, though. Good on them to make the upsets, similar to us. Up against Texas A&M, who beat Murray State, who upset Waco. Surprised they got a two seed. And, of course, in our region, it's going <laughs> to... What? Wow. Wow. Look at the upsets. Look at the upset upsets throughout this region. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? The Sweet 16 matchups, the highest seed was a nine in the Sweet 16. Now, of course, you know, this didn't all happen by chance. We knocked off the three seed Memphis. We knocked off the six seed in Michigan State by three points. But Georgetown knocked off Utah State. 90-76, and then we beat them to get to the Elite Eight. But Ohio State knocked off in the second round by 10 points against Western Kentucky. North Carolina State, the five seed, knocked off by Milwaukee, who knocked off BYU. Assuming that's BYU, Provo. 75-71 in that first round matchup. And then Milwaukee knocks off North Carolina State, same way we did, right? The 13 and 14, both fly, flying through. But the 9-10, both flying through as well. Upsets galore. And if the upset train keeps on going, <laughs> that's us beating the 13 seed. So our, our games are getting easier right now. We could be headed for the Final Four. We should be headed for the Final Four. We should get blown out once we get there. But are you kidding me? A Final Four matchup this early? This early in our series? It, you know, here, here's the thing. I, I, I noticed that there was a comment about upsets. That, that it was unrealistic. It's not. It's not unrealistic. Okay, here, here's the thing. You watch a lot of tournaments, okay? Year after year after year after year. With 68 teams, there's a lot of games each and every season. Now, you will regularly see anywhere from one to three one seeds make it to the final four. But there's always upsets. You never see seeds one through eight win the first round. Never. As in, it is more likely to see an upset even in the first round than it is to see the all the the favorites, all the higher seeded teams win their game. More often than not, you will see an upset in each of the four grids. At least one. And then. In the second round, it's the same thing. It's the same story. Now, the better team will win more often than not, which is why you will get one or two or three one seeds and a two seed or a three seed, and occasionally you'll see a four seed make it to the final four. But it's not impossible to see a 13-14 matchup. It's not impossible to see upsets to this scale. It's happened. We are not going to win the championship. Milwaukee is not going to win the championship. But upsets are very much a regular part in real life. In this game, this, I've never seen it to this extent. But look at the other grids. 1-3. 1-3. 1-6. That is normal. That, that is every single tournament. Every time this tournament happens, that is what you see. It's not one versus two all the time. It is always one versus three or two versus four or wh whatever. This is... Uh, Statistically, between my 
17, 19, and now 22 editions of this. And if you haven't figured it out by now, I do not play each and every game over the course of a season. I play a lot of seasons because we're climbing from the bottom to the top. Now, my teams are OP considering the level we play at. But that's not because the game's too easy. It's because I have a direct focus. I work hard on it and, and I make good teams that are capable of winning. Should we make the Final Four? No, but we've had a little help along the way. We've had a Michigan State team that was from a big conference but didn't have a great season, and we beat them. We had a Georgetown team that's from a good conference but really was mediocre this year, and we beat them. We got lucky that we're going up against a Milwaukee and that we got a Georgetown. Memphis, that was, uh, that was definitely a bit of an upset, but we've seen a three-team lose. Duke lost this year. Weren't they a two seed in the first round? It does happen. Anyway, we are a good team and we are capable of winning. And, you know, outside of one position, we've got depth and we play well tactically. And the one area where we regularly get into trouble is fouls. And what happened late in that Georgetown game? They picked up six, eight points on us pretty quickly because of the fouls. But it was also because of that aggressiveness that forced the plus 10 turnovers. And that was the key that gave us a huge lead. That made it a win. That made it comfortable. That got us to win by 17. The intensity of our defense was both a blessing and a curse in that game. But we came out ahead. I know the sport. I know the risk of playing that way. But I also know the rewards of playing that way. And guess what? That's how I coach the game. And that's how my teams perform. So we have a Conference E opponent. Wide a bit higher than us, but Conference E. Uh, they were 23-9 and this season. 12-4 and in Conference. It looks like they were probably their Conference winner, you would think, based on that. But they're still... Not quite as strong of a season as we have had, but I think that the advantage of playing in a higher division than us is what got them a 13 seed while we only got a 14. And we actually, matchup-wise, 53% is the odds. We are the favorite. They've only had three games against top 25 opponents. They did get the upset on the road at BYU. Tight contest there. Got blown out. And then did have a slender win against North Carolina State at home. And we're looking at same sort of story as what we had previously. They've got a definite advantage at point guard. William Love, very similar numbers. Eric Johnson, clear advantage. Doubling up the points. Extra rebound. Stetson. Disadvantage on numbers, but apparently an advantage in the head to head comparison of the two. And hold, there's your real clear cut advantage for us. We got to watch out for point guard. We should have a big advantage at center. Similar numbers from the bench, and no advantage. Uh, we are plus three points per game. And now that we're talking conference E, not conference A or B, the gap, I think, for division is, is going to be less, three to four points instead of five that we were talking about. So we're, we're talking about similar offense, maybe a point or two better defensively. We shoot the ball definitely a, a bit better than they do. So better shooting percentage. Again, plus three on the rebounds, plus one on the blocks. And they do not turn the ball over like Georgetown. I don't think this is going to be an easy game. I don't think it's going to be an easy game, but we still have every opportunity to uh, come away the winner. They do seem to be a team that was undervalued by the selection committee like we were, where Georgetown was overvalued. Georgetown wasn't that good this season. So 
So as we get this game away, underway, our first ever Elite Eight matchup, I think, right? We got to the Sweet 16 in that first trip to the tournament, I think, is as far as we got. We, we opened with the first three-pointer of the game. By the way, that was Eric Johnson, 3 nothing. Back to the defensive end here. We have a little momentum still from that shot. Oh, back-to-back, -back. and the foul. Our second already. They make one of two from the line, but the worrying part is we have three fouls already in the first two minutes of this half. So struggling in that department. They finally make their first basket a three-pointer. They just won for two. They can't even hardly get a shot off the way our defense is playing. They've had a lot of possessions, and they've only had two field goal attempts. Hmm. And they've had four free throw attempts, though. Seven. Seven free throw attempts. <laughs> they've had seven free throw attempts. 5-0 on the fouls. And yet we only trail by one. Well, anyway, I do think based on what we were looking at there statistically as we trail by just two points here despite the fact that it's 5-0 on the foul calls i do think that this is going to be a harder matchup than the georgetown one just looking at even though the ranking right the ranking favored georgetown i i think georgetown was a fairly mediocre team now yes conference b you have to account for that and i think that's why the selection committee selected them 10th and selected milwaukee and us lower but i honestly think it's closer it's tighter and that's realistic too 20 years ago it wasn't 20 years ago there wasn't as much talent right i i grew up supporting my hometown portland trailblazers in the 90s where if it wasn't for some guy named Michael Jordan, whoever that is, Portland would have had two or, well, they would have had two championships in the 90s. That was the only thing standing in their way. We're up 10 points. Now that the fouls have evened out a little bit, we've only committed two more. They've committed five, and suddenly we have a 10-point lead from a three-point deficit. It's amazing what happens when we are not committing fouls uh, when the other teams actually do get called for something. The defense intensity is a thing, though. <laughs> it is a thing, okay? It's it's not by chance that we get called for more fouls than our opponents. 7-6 right now, and it's 31-17 as we continue the run. Anyway, in the 90s, the, the talent pool, it wasn't that deep. There's a reason why, well, go back further, <laughs> go back to the 70s. There's a reason why Wilt Chamberlain was so freaking good. There's a reason why Irving Magic Johnson dominated. There's a reason why Michael Jordan dominated. The quality of player was nothing compared to what it is on the whole across the league now the the elite talents we're up 17 right now the elite talents up 20. the elite talents have always been elite there's always been players that have been above and beyond Let, let's talk baseball for a second I'll throw this one out there not everybody knows baseball but i'm sure most of you know this name babe ruth we're talking 100 years ago century ago babe ruth totally unfit fat man playing baseball he was drunk all the time he did nothing to take care of himself he was an angry bitter alcoholic who knew how to shift his weight had a sweet swing had a decent arm, actually, too. He wouldn't last five minutes in today's game. He wouldn't He wouldn't get out of single A, as in the lowest levels of the minor leagues. They cut into that lead a little bit before half. I, I missed out on that one. Uh, but we are up 44-33. Johnson with 16 points already. Love with 12. 
And my guy, Ed Hold, has only played seven minutes, two fouls early. Johnson has three fouls. Love has two. We had to rely on our bench here a bit. McNeil, eight points, three of four. Surprising. I'm guessing they're probably trying to double team Hold, even though he only played seven minutes. I, I have a feeling that's a big part of it. Hopefully, this is because two early fouls put him to the bench and not that he picked up an injury that I missed out on. 45% from the field. They're 50. 18 free throws. We did catch up a little bit with 15. 11, 11 on the fouls. Uh, turnovers? <laughs> Plus 12. Plus 12. That's been the difference maker so far as we get second half on the way. Anyway. It's true in most sports. With training the way it is these days with what we know about science and the availability to youth to go out and get proper coaching to get development on a scale that we never had before uh, women's professional soccer football uh, nwsl the pro league in the u.s seven point lead uh, they are really cutting into it here. I might need to focus on this game here in a little bit uh, to do something. We're already at four fouls here in the second half, too. So it's gone similarly to how the second half. We're going to take that 30-second timeout, and we come out of that with a score and some momentum and back to a 10-point lead as we get back-to-back -back buckets. Well-timed on the timeout, you got to keep an eye on how that momentum goes. Those timeouts make a huge difference when timed correctly. Anyway, NWSL had a rule about... 18 plus which was a very silly rule olivia moultrie teenager incredible talent good enough to be a pro had to go to court to fight for her right to to be a player won her case became the first ever teenager she then signed with my hometown Portland Thorns, which is part of the reason why I know this case. But I've seen her play in person many times, and she is a very, very talented. Uh, is she still 15, or did she just turn 16? I think she just turned 16. And where last season, after winning that case, she she did the, the your garbage time appearances. Center mid played, you know, 10 minutes a game late on. 12-point lead, by the way, and... Uh, they had built some momentum and I was about to use another timeout to make sure that that didn't continue and never mind <laughs> we we took care of it ourselves uh, but anyway this year for one thing total overhaul of midfield all four of your primary uh, midfielders from a year ago are either on loan in Lyon <laughs> because Lyon's Europe's biggest club and and she went to live out her dream of playing in Europe for a year, but it's on load, and she'll be back to Portland next year. But uh, Lindsay Horan for that player. And then Crystal Dunn out on maternity leave, and the other two retiring led to a total overhaul of the midfield, which led to a little bit of growing pains, but also it gave a, a bit of an opportunity to, hey, we have this young teenager who's talented to give her more minutes along with one signee, uh, Tina Higita, fantastic Japanese midfielder, by the way. Uh, wonderful, wonderful magic with her feet uh, on, on ball control. Uh, I actually took my own momentum away. Not a good thing there. Uh, five minutes to go here in the half, and we are up nine. Looking good. Uh, five minutes to go in the game, anyway. Uh, reshaping the midfield. Moultrie seeing more time. She's started their last couple of games, which they won by a combined like 8 0. Uh, incredible. 9 0. No, 10. Sorry, 10 0 in two games. A 4 0 win and a 6 0 win. And Moultrie very much center of that creative force, uh, along with Sophia Smith. Anyway. The, the talent pool, the access to, to training for young players, we're seeing that development. You've seen it in the NBA too, right? That late 90s trend, your Kobe Bryant's 
you were LeBron James is coming straight out of high school back when that was still allowed where you could skip college entirely you didn't have the one year rule as you have now minute to go 10 point game they cut it to nine but we still have the momentum we're looking good to make it to that final four 76 65 i think that one just about put it away i thought we were already coming down within a minute and we're not it's at a minute six to go but the momentum has grown even more and it's now 78 65 talent pool gets deeper and deeper and deeper so you see less of the standout performances that you saw before because your players in the g league are better than your good players were 20 or 30 years ago that's the point that i was trying to make here in the end we run away with it in the final minute 83 83 67 the final their top scorer land got 14 today mcclendon added 15 good performance from him but otherwise their team not stepping up not doing enough and we ultimately did love with 15 points johnson with a huge day 22 did take 23 field goal attempts to get those 22 points though so not uh, not the kind of production that I like to see. Not a great day from him, even though he had 22. And that's something that I look at. A lot of people see 22 points and go, ooh, ho, ho, big performance. Not me. Not me. If they're inefficient, if they're ineffective, if it's volume that gets them there, I'm not impressed. Uh, for me, the biggest example of that was always Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was a volume shooter. He scored a lot of points because he took a ton of shots. He wasn't very efficient. He took hard shots. He was never afraid to take them. And you obviously need that in a scorer. But I like efficient scoring because you're only going to get X number of attempts. And if you have to take 10 more attempts than somebody else to score the same number of points, then I'd rather take the other player who did it on 10 fewer attempts. Efficiency is very, very important. Anyway, the point that I was trying to make through all of that over the course of this game, as we have now qualified for the final four, but again, I think this is about this is going to be where the limit is. We got really lucky that our last two games in particular were against other teams that had also provided upsets. That is part of the sport. It does happen. We benefited from it, and we find ourselves with our first ever final four appearance. Point being... The game, the quality, has gotten deeper and deeper. And what that has done is where you had a Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls and then you had a, a Clyde Drexler Portland Trailblazers that was right behind that. And you had a Charles Barkley-led Phoenix Suns just behind that. And then you had everybody else, right? You had the Knicks, you had the Pacers, but there really wasn't much else in terms of teams offering much of a challenge because the league would really really fall off because the average player that's that's the key and that's why i'm a premier league fan in in soccer and football is because the average player it's not about the best team or the best players it's about the league as a whole and i love the premier league because you're 20th place your your norwich city is capable of beating anybody else now sometimes right you'll see the last team really really fall apart and not get it but newcastle united 20th 19th they added what two players in the january transfer window ended up 12th 11th something along those lines and they i mean the damn near caught up to manchester united at the end of the season from the bottom of the table those two players you know one of them was out injured for a while it was more about mentality than anything but the quality and that's the thing it's so tight brentford january added christian erickson pretty much nothing else was that the only transfer they made it might have been and they went to a whole nother level one player one player who replaced one player and he was only you know this much better than that one player 
But it's so competitive because the average is everything, right? It's so tight. It's so competitive. Meanwhile, in other leagues, you could have your worst game playing for Barcelona, right? Barcelona is a great example. Absolute nightmare last year. And yet they were still third, fourth place throughout the season. They were beyond disgusting to watch play. But there was such a gulf between the top and the bottom of the league that despite the absolute nightmare that they were experiencing, and they definitely had less points than they've had in any other season recent in recent history, it still only knocked them down a couple of positions. That wouldn't be the case, right? We saw a handful of years ago Chelsea having one of those years. We saw Tottenham having one of those years. This year was Everton having one of those years. Finally, back to the point once again. I keep going off on the tangent to help prove the point of what I'm trying to make here. Quality of depth has risen to such a level that the competition league-wide gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And we see the same thing here. Conference A, Conference B, Conference C, that's your elite teams. But they're not blowing everybody else away. It's it's not 110 to 12 final score. 40 years ago, that's a pretty pretty regular outcome from what we would see of a conference A team playing a a, a conference what was the bottom tier? V. Right? Top versus bottom blowing teams out by 100 points 90 points 60 points you don't see that anymore now during non-conference schedules i pay attention to my oregon ducks right they lose not all the time but they lose against your montanas against your portland states your ups your seattle U's, your the smaller conference teams can beat bigger teams. Now, the bigger teams are still going to win more often than not. Your bigger teams are still going to win your championships. But there is quality. There is depth. There is competition. Mike Harris is not a very good point guard. Mike Harris can still handle himself out on the court a bit. He's not terrible. He had zero points today. He had 10 assists. I'm the Catalan Gamer. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there. And bye for now.